higher education. My name is Katie Gaston. I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager with Kuali Build. And today I'll be supporting with facilitating uh, the discussion. So before we jump in, a few things to mention for the call. Uh, just so you know, all attendees will be on mute throughout today's presentation. But if you have any questions for us, please click on the Q and A button at the bottom of your Zoom window and go ahead and type any questions throughout the call and we'll address them at the end. Our panelists will be responding to questions throughout the webinar. So please feel free to share them as they come to mind. Um, and just so you know, today's webinar is being recorded and will be sent to all attendees and those who registered following the webinar. We will also go ahead and send the slides that we'll be reviewing today if you'd like to use them in the future and or just have them for your reference. Before I jump in to the content, um, I'm going to go ahead and spend just a few minutes talking about Kuali, which is the host of today's webinar. So if you haven't heard of Kuali before, uh, we are a software company that builds software specifically for higher education. We focus on building modular software, on having really strong design principles built into the software, and on building fully cloud native uh, software as well. Um, and we are exclusive specifically to higher education. We actually began out of higher education, which I'll share a little bit about. Um, our origins, like I said, are from higher education. Um, and because of this, we actually focus really strongly on building software tools that help individuals in higher education achieve the, mis the mission and further the mission of their institutions, um, primarily student success uh, or depending on your institution, contributing meaningful research and giving back to the communities that you're a greater part of. Kuali, like I said, was born out of higher education. In 2004, uh, a number of schools got together and they said, look, there has to be a better way we can do software in higher education. Uh, they were used to working with behemoth inefficient systems and having really difficult vendor relationships at that time. So at that time, the foundation, a nonprofit foundation was started in 2004 and it was created to create effective software to really move the mission of higher education forward and do it without abusive vendor relationships. So what happened is they created an open source software platform, primarily focusing on financial management. Um, and there was a lot of partners at that time, higher education institutions that signed on board. Throughout that process, we learned a lot of things. We learned how to communicate really well as a community. We learned how to collaborate with institutions across the states. But at that time, we realized we didn't focus a lot on design. That was one of the things we learned in the process. And we had a lot of projects going on simultaneously, which led us to, from those learnings, create what Quali is today. Uh, Quali, the company, was started in 2014. And again, like I said, we build amazing software specific to higher education. And we do it with the foundation of coming from a history of higher education. We work with over 200 institutions um, today, both big and small, private and public, and we continuously grow that number. And then specifically, we have five different product lines, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, one of those today, but we work with the individuals on campus from the registrar, the CFO with the financial platform. We have a business continuity suite um, to help you prepare for things like a pandemic or disasters that can happen. Um, we have a curriculum uh, management software. And then today I'll talk a little bit about our product quality build, which is a low code forms and workflow solution. And um, so like I said, uh, quality build focuses on automating forms and processes across campus. Um, and it was created out of uh, the need that we saw on campus, which was again, teams and IT leaders want to focus on why individuals got into higher education in the first place. You want to empower your teams to further the mission of your institution. But what we found is that things are getting in the way of doing that, primarily manual processes. Uh, paper processes, I would say, was the, in the way 10 years ago. And today what we're seeing is PDF processes. That's an improvement. Processes are digitized, but they're still really manual. Um, there's not an automated process that helps link things together. And when someone needs to create a new process or continue a process, let's say like a change of major request, they do what's always been done, like either using paper or creating a Word document or a PDF. Um, and ultimately that leads to insecure and costly and inefficient solutions. So we believed that there's a sweet spot between 
having enough system complexity to meet the business requirements, but making something user friendly enough where everyone on campus can actually use it. And we knew this because we spent over four years validating this need with partners of ours in our community that says, yeah, this is not being solved today. So on one side of the coin, you have powerful complex systems like an ERP or an ECM or a student information system, and they meet business requirements, but typically they require an IT engineer to maintain and build. And on the other side, you have systems that are, the problem I would say with the complex side is that they're really not accessible to business users. On the easy and simple side, you have things like, let's say Google Forms or other systems that pop up on campus. And they're really easy to use, but typically they don't meet all the security or scalability requirements that is needed for a really powerful system. So we believe there's this sweet spot in the middle where a system that focuses on really strong design, but actually empowers business users to do some really powerful things and a system that your IT team will actually buy off on because it's a reasonable expense, but it doesn't actually require an engineer to build it and to use it. So I'll give you a little preview. Um, this is the homepage you can see of Quali Build where you can build different apps, which is a combination of, of forms and automated workflow and approval processes built in. Uh, you can create mobile friendly, mobile ready forms um, with uh, simple and complex field types and a variety of information throughout sections and pages to create a really positive either student or faculty experience depending on who the form and the workflow is going to. And then with a drag and drop workflow creator, you can route information across campus, have approvals, acknowledgements, and really powerful integrations with pretty much any key campus system that you need. And you can automatically route approvals to individuals like a department chair or a college dean because our approval system is built into a role-based approval routing. Some of the institutions that we work with today, Davidson College ended up working with BUILD because they saw 90% of their needs on campus um, were not being addressed by a complex system. So a system like BUILD can actually empower their users to build their own forms and workflow solutions and transform and, and, and uh, redo some of the PDF processes that exist. And UC San Diego is another institution, one of our original design partners, um, that is now rolling out build in order to truly increase the capacity of their IT department on campus. So like I said, some of the, the reasons we focus on build is we truly believe if you empower teams to automate complex processes, you not only can increase IT capacity, but ultimately you can truly empower digital transformation across your campus because you open up the democratization of technology. Um, so with that in mind, with the idea of digital transformation, I'm going to go ahead and pass over the baton to our speaker today. Um, we asked uh, Carl to join us uh, primarily because we're doing a lot of content on digital transformation right now. Um, coming with, from our roots of higher education, while now is a really hard time in higher education, in a way we see it somewhat exciting because there's so much transformation from a technological standpoint that's happening on campuses in somewhat of a forced momentum. And we're doing quite a bit of content, webinars, eBooks, on how you can empower your institution to take advantage of this time. And what are the things you need to know from a technology standpoint, from a step-by-step uh, -step standpoint, from a buy-in standpoint, in order to help move your institution forward from a digital transformation standpoint. And so Carl's gonna speak with us today about one aspect of that, which would be motivating and truly getting staff and faculty to adopt new transformation, transformative technology. Uh, using uh, uh, something that you might not have heard about in a few years, gamification, the concept that we've heard probably at some point about in our careers. And so I'm going to introduce Carl, our speaker today. Carl received his doctorate of education in the instructional design program at the University of Pittsburgh. The field of instructional design primarily focuses on the systematic and informal design, development, delivery, and evaluation of instruction in corporate, educational, and governmental environments. The systematic focus is the cornerstone of his presentations and consulting work. Carl is a practicing knowledge broker, frequently speaking to businesses, corporations, and professional societies, universities, and nonprofit organizations. Carl consults with businesses on topics related to the convergence of learning, manufacturing, and e-technology, 
helping organizations transition into learning organizations through the effective application of technology. So without further ado, Carl, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and pass control over to you. Thanks. Uh, great to be here. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. I'm very excited to be talking about uh, digital transformation and what it means from the uh, higher education level. And interestingly, uh, just today, I was uh, asked to uh, uh, complete a uh, complement um, requirement form in PDF. So <laughs> Katie, definitely, uh, we're using uh, that, that system that you had mentioned before. Uh, could use a new one. So let's talk about what is gamification and, and and does it work? Is it really effective for what we want to do? Then talk a little bit about what is digital transformation. Then talk about how do you combine gamification and digital transformation so the two of them can actually work together. So I, I kind of view gamification as the motivational aspect and then the digital transformation as the change aspect or the kind of the meat and potatoes aspect of it. So let's talk, talk about what is gamification. So gamification is basically using game-based mechanics, aesthetics, and game thinking to engage people, to have them motivate action, promote learning, and really solve problems. And the important thing to think about gamification, some people think gamification means playing games. And it, it doesn't mean playing games. Gamification means using elements, parts, and pieces of games to achieve our ultimate goal. So as I said before, it's not playing games at work, at the university, at the college, at the, at the two-year school. It's, it's not playing games at work. It's um, trying, it's not trying to make learning fun and giggling and everybody laughing and this whole great time. That might be a byproduct of some of what happens, but that's not the primary goal. The primary goal really is to move action forward, encourage people to do what they should already be doing and want to already be doing. It's not a trivialization of work or processes, and it's not perfect for every situation. Some people kind of laugh. They say, well, aren't you the gamification guru? And don't you think you should gamify everything? And there are some people that do think you should game every, gamify everything, but I'm not one of them. I think we need to be very strategic about where we apply gamification and what we want to accomplish with gamification. And then um, it's not only focused on game mechanics, it's focused on many other things that we will talk about uh, today. So interesting, if you look at the top five most motivating gamification elements, because we've all kind of heard of it, there are things like rewards. So you get rewarded, recognized for things that you've done, you get badges for moving up, you get points, leaderboards and levels. But these are what people are saying motivates them from a gamification perspective. And um, it's kind of funny because you, I, I always often hear, well, you know, adults aren't, aren't, you know, really motivated by that kind of stuff. It doesn't really work. But if you turn around and look at um, status symbols, look at what adults gravitate towards, look at some of the things that we're interested in, <laughs> we can see that we're, we all probably belong to some sort of reward program. We all wear logo tized outfits or cars. Those are forms of badges, uh, social badges, social credibility. Uh, we get reward points for shopping at the grocery store, all kinds of things. So they're integrated into what we're doing pretty much on a regular basis because they provide some motivational aspects. And a badging system, as I said before, uh, implementing a transparent badging system allows the peers to challenge themselves. So it's not so much like a lot of people hear gamification, they think, oh, it's competition against other people and I want to be on the top of the leaderboard. And, but really, if it's done well, it's about competing against yourself, trying to be a better version of what you did yesterday, trying to move forward in using tools and techniques that you've got to use anyway in your work environment. So why not add a little bit of gamified elements to that? And here's what I talk about collaboration, right? Allowing learners to engage in competitive but collaborative interactions can be very beneficial and letting them work together in teams. So I always give the example of, of a leaderboard, right? If you're the number one person on the leaderboard, you love the leaderboard. It's awesome. 
If you're number 10, you're okay with it. If you're number 11, you don't like the leaderboard. And if you're number 100, you hate the leaderboard. It's actually demotivating. So single competition leaderboards, me versus you, are not really good tools. A better version of a leaderboard might be my team versus your team. Right? So if I'm in 100th place, I might not care about being on the leaderboard, but if I could help my team just a little bit by doing something, I don't want to let my team down. So that's how a leaderboard can be helpful. A leaderboard can also be helpful of allowing you to compare yourself to where you were yesterday. So that allows, a leaderboard allows you to see where you can go how you've improved. You can even use a leaderboard to show standards and how close are you to a standard. We as uh, individual humans really like to know where we stand in terms of the average. You know, we all want to be above average. And if you survey all of us, we all are above average, uh, which uh, can't be the case, but that's what we try to strive for. So um, those are some techniques that can be really kind of helpful. So that's gamification. So now let's look at what is digital transformation. I really like this quote about digital transformation being a radical rethinking of how an organization uses technology, people, and processes to change its performance. And I was, um, uh, yesterday I was talking to somebody, I was on a some kind of show and they were talking about the future of higher education. And I said, well, we're really in a place now where some institutions are being asked to, uh, by the current situation, really to rethink what it means to be an institution. And one of the things we talked about is, does an institution need to be a four-year commitment? Can it be longer than four years? And he's like, what are you, you're crazy? Why would it be longer than four years? But imagine subscribing to a university, like you subscribe to Netflix. And for years, the university provides you with pieces of content going on. Now, you have to be pretty digitally savvy to do that over time, but that's what we talk about when you think about transformation, really not being the same thing we were a year ago, but being something different and something a little bit more radical. So what are some of the benefits of this digital transformation? Well, one is, um, if done right, greater resource management, which means you can uh, coordinate um, pockets of technology and items and access within an organization. So time savings, money savings. I'm a part of the Pennsylvania state system of higher education. And we have 14 state universities spread out through Pennsylvania, which is a pretty big state. It takes about six hours to drive. You know, everybody talks about Texas being big and it's big. California's big and it's big, but Pennsylvania is also pretty big. It takes like six hours to drive across the whole state. So it's pretty big. And so we have all these campuses, but we have, you know, 14 different uh, accounts receivable, 14 different um, uh, registration systems, 14 different uh, introductory classes to sign, you know, introductory sign. So we have a lot of redundancies that if we brought those together, uh, they would help the organizational system. If you digitally trans transform correctly, you also have fewer delays and processes. So one of the things I remember younger uh, going to uh, arena registration, you know, where you had to kind of have these little index cards and we had to figure out what classes and you would trade cards with friends. Very, very inefficient. Um, so now we have a little bit more efficient processes, but we still have the faculty member oftentimes is uh, a bottleneck in terms of whether or not somebody can get into a class because of sizes and prerequisites. And so streamlining with digital transformation actually creates fewer delays in processes. And I, one of the things that I like to do when I look at a process is, what is the answer to the request? Like I have to fill out lots of requests. If the answer is always yes, why are we asking, right? So what we should is when the answer is not clear, that's when a permission or a level needs to be in place. And the great thing about it is if we do this right, we have better student experiences. The students will, you know, again, if you look at the research, why are students don't like universities or why they feel alienated? One of the things is because they feel like a number, right? Get in line, do this, input your information. But if you had faster systems that uh, were adaptable to the student 
and didn't get in the way of what the student was trying to accomplish, you could have more satisfied students. You'd have students who could interact from anywhere, anytime, right? They can do TikTok and they can do, well, students really aren't doing Facebook, but uh, TikTok and Instagram from anywhere that they are, yet they have to come to campus to register or they have to sit in front of a computer, can't use their phone to register. You know, all those kind of things can cause some problems. Streamlining, as I said before, encourages a, a digital culture. If you think about this great digital experiment we're going through right now, forced experiment with the pandemic, a lot of people are becoming more and more comfortable doing things online and they're starting to notice that some of the online processes are a little clunky. So if you're having this digital culture, wouldn't it make sense to incorporate that into our systems to serve students better and then get rid of this thing I call paperwork friction, which uh, basically is um, having people fill out things over and over again or in different versions of the same information, copying and pasting information um, always uh, can be very difficult to do. So one of the things that I like to talk about in implementing digital transformations is this thing I call the USA principle. Understand the process first, simplify the process, and then automate the process. The problem I see in lots of organizations is somebody, the provost, the VP, somebody goes off, sees a digital transformation, presentation, workshop, case study, and says, okay, we're coming back and we're gonna digitally transform and we have to put all this stuff online. But until you work to understand your current processes, how they work, why they work, what they do, it doesn't make sense to just digitize them. If we digitize an inefficient, ineffective process, then we will have a faster, more speedy, inefficient, ineffective process. And that's not really what we want. So we want to do this understand uh, USA principle. So what does it actually mean? So when I say understand, I mean, understand what is the ultimate purpose of this process? What are we trying to achieve? And uh, there's a lot of times where I'll ask people, you know, why do we have this process of permissions and sign offs? And people are like, I don't know. I don't know why we have that. I went into one organization one time and they said that they wanted the system to automatically create a purchase requisition when the goods were received. And I said, well, wait a minute. In this uh, university, isn't the process you issue a purchase requisition, then you issue a purchase order, then it goes to the vendor, the vendor fills the purchase order and then it's delivered. And they said, yes, that's the process that's supposed to be, but we never, we are ordering, we never have time. And so we never get around to creating the requisition. So the question then is why have a requisition? Why not say, okay, anything under a hundred dollars doesn't need a requisition or 200 or 500, something like that. So, so what's the purpose? So people don't spend too much money. So think, and so you need to examine that. You should look for prevention of mistakes. Is the purpose of the process or parts of the process to prevent mistakes? What are the cost of those mistakes? How serious are those mistakes? What's the setback? How can you recover from the mistakes? Sometimes it's catastrophic and you have to have certain systems and processes in place. Sometimes it's inconsequential, but it's still there for some reason. So examining the process, maybe it's to verify information, to give a proof. So understand ultimate purpose. Then you wanna understand what's the typical outcome of this particular process. What happens as an end result? Does somebody uh, get financial aid? Is somebody denied financial aid? Is someone uh, given access to a dorm room? Is someone denied? What is the typical outcome? And you wanna look at if, Again, as I said before, if the outcome is always one thing, then maybe you could back up and see what different kinds of process eliminations could happen if the process is always the same. And finally, how does it help the university? Are we doing things that are helping the university or hindering the university? Faculty, staff, fellow administrators, other stakeholders, what's being done to help the university? And then we want to simplify the process. So I often, you know, and oftentimes we'll have literally 
uh, back in the day when you could have more than two people in a room, we would have post-it notes or sticky notes and they would represent each element of the process and we would go over those and rearrange them and figure them out. But now you have things like Google Jamboard and all kinds of tools that allow you to do that virtually. So you could still do this virtually, but you wanna look for things like redundancy. You wanna look for duplicate permissions. You wanna look for things that are um, linear, like this has to happen and then this and then that. Why could they happen in parallel? Is there multiple permissions that you could get? Those kind of things. Can time be reduced? What are the time delays and why do they happen? Is it because someone is very busy to sign off? Is it because someone uh, never has time to look? Or is it because maybe the system can't send messages and needs to send some messages, automate some of that, uh, some of that um, triggering, trigger some events, trigger some, uh, we also looked at things like variation, like if there's a variation in the process, trigger someone right away. Maybe the variation requires attention, but the standard doesn't. Um, we've done things like um, um, statistical process control, upper control limits, lower control limits, and you can track if something's trending toward one of the control limits. So those are ways to simplify processes. Look at the Pareto, the 80-20 rule, right? Uh, typically 20% of the process takes 80% of the time. Well, let's examine that. Let's see what happens. And then what is the simplest method for achieving results? Um, it might be automation, but it might be eliminating steps. It might be other things. So again, jumping into automation is not always the answer. And then finally, we automate. And automation, as I said before, isn't in and of itself this, this miracle cure. There has to be some considerations about automation. So for example, if you look at it, is the interface easy to use? Are you, you know, you may have one system or one process that you're thinking about, but you know, I know our one of one of the folks on our administrative staff, uh, Tina, Tina's got like ten systems, ten separate systems she has to deal with. So when you introduce a new system, if you're not making it easy in terms of look and feel and functionality you've just now increased Tina's workload because now she's got to learn a whole new system. And if you make it radically different than the other nine systems, now she's got to keep in mind that all of the time on top of her actual job, which is not to learn new systems. So it becomes very important to think about the look and feel, the intuitive functionality of it. Think of things like Google, you, you go to basically a blank white screen, type in a word and get your content. Now, could you do fancier searches? Absolutely, you can do Boolean logic and all kinds of searches in Google's, but there's not a huge explanation of how to do that unless you go looking for it. So it keeps the, the functionality very clean, very quick, easy to do. Then on the other side, if you're gonna analyze the data, because if you're putting in automated systems, one of the advantages that you should be taking advantage of is the fact that they have robust dashboards. If you're not gonna use the data that you're collecting to make better decisions, then stop collecting the data because you're wasting everybody's time. And if you have these dashboards, take the time to invest in somebody learning what the data means and how that data can be influenced because maybe maybe people aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Maybe the timeline is too long. Maybe you your performance compared to others is not where it should be. So looking at that can be very helpful. And then of course, any system has to be easy to maintain and update. So that's the uh, USA principle. But when you think about it, I love this quote, if we're going to digitally transform the organization and we're gonna add gamification, when a snake sheds its skin, it changes. But when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, that's a transformation. And what we're looking for is this transformation. And I think if we combine digital transformation and gamification, we're going to have some pretty um, powerful results. So one of those results, one of the reasons why we have challenges though in that area, and some of you may have tried to implement gamification before and found it not to be successful or heard of stories where it's not successful. Early when gamification came out, 
Um, I think the Gartner group or Deloitte or somebody said, you know, 80% of gamification implementations are, are going to fail. Well, I've seen that same number for technology implementations, transformation implementations. I kind of feel the consulting firms just have that number and, and pull it out. But the point that they're making should not be lost, even though I don't think the number's accurate. And the point is, if you don't stop and understand your challenges, simplify them, and then figure out the best approach, you will run into problems. And one of the problems is not understanding gamification, thinking that it's a game. In fact, many gamification implementations don't look at gamification at all. Uh, let me give you an example. Early in the life of LinkedIn, they put in a little button, a little uh, bar that said percent to complete profile. That to me is gamification. A progress bar is a form of gamification. Well, when they put that progress bar in, you're 80% complete or 20% uh, to go or uh, you're 50% complete, it increased the completion of LinkedIn profiles by over 20%, just by putting in that little progress bar. So giving people knowledge of how far they are from a target, adding a progress indicator can be very helpful. Now, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you you need to add a bunch of progress bars. What I'm saying is strategic use of gamification elements can actually move performance or expectations forward. Now, another mistake that some people make is they have a lack of overall strategy. Somebody says, hey, gamification is great. Digital transformation is great. Awesome. Let's go ahead and do it. And they do it piecemeal without an overall strategy. Strategy takes time. Strategy takes a little bit of effort to develop. Strategy takes a lot of planning. But it's kind of like building a house, like Bob Vila, right? Measure twice, cut once. So figure out your uh, planning for your overall strategy, then implement against it. Now, that's not to say there won't be changes, that there won't be problems, that the landscape is not what it was six months ago, all true. But if you are doing piecemeal, you can't change an overall strategy. If you have an overall strategy, you can evaluate things that happen in view of that strategy. And to me, strategy is about the end goal. What are we trying to accomplish? be more efficient, treat our students better, provide better data. What are the elements of our strategy? And then uh, lots of organizations have lack of digitization experience and gamification. That can be handled a number of different ways, bringing in uh, a software company that knows about gamification and digitization, bring in consultants, um, studying. Look across the campus. There may be faculty on campus or people on campus that have a lot of experience who may even be consulting with outside organizations. You just don't know it on your own campus. So often uh, campus is a rich place to find um, experts. Um, and then overcomplicating. The other thing that I think about that we do a lot of times, like I look at uh, some of the software that I'm forced to use both as a faculty member and on the administrative side. And it honestly looks to me like somebody who was developing the software took every single suggestion that any human ever had and added it into the software. So somebody said, hey, can it do that? Of course, we'll put it in. Can it? Of course, and not really thinking about how all those things work together. So as a faculty member, when I go in maybe to, um, to do my expense report, you know, there's like 14 layers and 15 things I don't have to do or know about, but I'm confronted with it every time I go into the software. So it's an overcomplication. It's probably for travel of, you know, a VP traveling needs different permissions than I do. Somebody maybe in uh, who travels a lot overseas needs different permissions than I do. So, so overcomplication can be a huge issue that should be thought about. Only show the, the, the person using the software what they need to do. And if they need to do something else, either ask them or give them the option, like in Google, to search other places. So on top of all those digital transformation issues, we've got challenges just returning to campus. Um, and so uh, in Pennsylvania, we're, we're at Bloomsburg and uh, uh, many of our sister state 
schools are opening, but some of them aren't. Some of them already declared we're going online. We're not going to open. So we have all these challenges communicating with students, communicating with administrative staff, communicating with faculty. There's uncertainty at multiple levels. If, for example, Pennsylvania spikes again in COVID cases, then we're all going back home to teach our courses. But what does that mean? So, for example, I have to do things like go through the search process. What is the automated search process to bring in, well, we no longer bring in candidates, but to evaluate candidates, to fairly measure candidates. We're a state university, so we have all kinds of state requirements. I still have requirements if I'm going to drive somewhere for um, uh, an administrative function. I, I do a lot of grants. I've got to be in touch with my grants person about some grants that I'm involved with signing that paperwork. So there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen. Are the grants even going to continue? And what also happens is people sometimes have a lack of motivation to change because it's very uncertain. So we want to have very certain things. So there can be this lack of motivation. There's a lot of fear and anxiety about what the future holds, especially with colleges and even policies and procedures are uncertain. What do you do if a uh, in terms of cleaning, how do you let the cleaning person know that this class is over, that they need to come and clean before the next class, and if somebody had COVID in that class, how do you alert the cleaning? All kinds of things to consider. So if we look at a roadmap for what we're going to do in terms of COVID, in terms of digital transformation, in terms of all of this, uh, one of my favorite quotes is by Charles Darwin, who basically says, look, it's not the strongest that survives or the smartest that survives. It's the one that can adapt to change. And so we need to think about how we help our universities adapt to change. And there's a couple things that we can do. One of them is to use gamification to help motivate people to do some things that sh should be doing. So for example, I may not feel very motivated to do X, Y, or Z, but now if gamification gives me a little bit more transparency in, in terms of, hey, if you finish this, you're this much closer to completing this process. Or if we finish this, we're this much closer to opening up. If we finish this, we're this much closer to this financial goal. All of that can be very motivational to me. So if we look at motivation in general, there's something called the self-determination theory of motivation. And what does that say? Well, basically, it's a study of why and how people are motivated across lots of different disciplines. And they boiled it down to three key elements that motivates almost anyone. One is autonomy. That's the feeling that you are able to make decisions on your own. Things are not being forced upon you. Mastery is the sense that you can do this. It's not outside of your realm of expertise. So when you think about it, often when a new system is, is implemented, there's not a whole lot of feelings of autonomy, like, okay, you've got to do this system. And there's not a whole sense of, ma you know, I, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get how this system works. I don't understand it. I don't know how it, how it functions, right? So we want to try to um, encourage the feeling of autonomy. That's where we ask people about, hey, how do you, let me understand this process under USA principle. Let's sim, how would you simplify this process? What are some things that you would uh, eliminate? And that gives a sense of uh, autonomy. And then because they've seen it, and it's not just thrust upon them, that gives them a sense of mastery. And finally, the last level is connectedness, which basically means um, social connections. And again, in times of great uncertainty, there are, we feel like we don't have these social connections. We're all Zooming each other and we don't know how that feels. So adding that connectedness can be very helpful if we want to motivate people. So autonomy, as I said before, is the feeling of a person has when they're in control, when they have the outcome, they make informed, uncoerced decisions, and they control their own destiny. So part of this is think about how you're going to roll out your digital transformation. Are you going to roll it out to your constituents or are you going to roll it out with your constituents? So you could partnership or you could dictate. And you really need to think about partnering with the people that are going to use it. Now, you're never going to please everybody or get everything into the software. And then there's always people that love the way it used to be. But you want to get the majority of people to say, yeah, uh, they asked me my opinion and I gave it or I had a chance to give my opinion and I didn't give it. 
we were in an organization one time and we were doing, uh, actually we had a bunch of administrative people from the university and we were creating training for them on a new system. And we asked them, you know, how do you like to learn? Where are you most comfortable learning? What kind of tools will help you learn? And one of the people afterwards came up to me and said, Carl, you know what? This is the first time anyone has ever asked me how I want to learn. And that was like, I'm like, well, wow, they should have been doing that all the time. But you know what? That person became a huge advocate. Why? Because we were listening to them. We gave them a sense of autonomy. We let them know that they could master this. So those are the kinds of things that we need to think about as we implement this digital transformation. We also want to think about creating what's called a mastery orientation. I talked about that before with the leaderboards, right? We want to compare ourselves to ourselves. We want to be the best version of ourselves. We want to master standards. Simply competing with other people with gamification and say, hey, I won, you lost, not really a healthy work environment. But if you can say, hey, look, I made it to level 99. Hey, so did I. Awesome. Or hey, let me help you get to the next level. Let me help you earn points for our team. So working together can be much, much more effective. It helps employees focus on their own proficiency rather than just being a little bit better than you. It's kind of like that story about, you know, two people are running from a bear and one person stops and puts on their tennis shoes. And the other person says, you're never going to outrun that bear. She goes, I don't have to. I just have to outrun you. Right? Well, then that's all for one. That's, I mean, that's all for your own, right? It's not caring about the other person. But if you say, hey, let's work together then we're in this together and then we have a feeling of ownership together and that we can master it together and all that really makes a difference in terms of these crazy uncertain times and then also if you have a mastery orientation the research indicates that you're more readily open to accepting errors and seeking challenges and anytime you're learning a new system it's a challenge and there will be errors and one of the things that lots of people like to say is, I don't want to do anything because I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to have an error. I don't want that to be, I don't want to be that person. So we have to create an environment where it's okay to make a mistake because that's toward mastering what the process is. And that leads to higher self-efficacy, which is basically a, a research term for confidence. So it makes you confident. What we want is confidence and competence. We want people to be competent in what they're doing and be confident that they can do it. And so if we set mastery challenges with gamification, helping people earn a badge, hey, you've earned the three day in a row, um, error free implementation, great. And we've even done things where, hey, you made the most, the error that everybody makes. So you get the everybody error award because everyone makes this error, right? So you kind of make, hey, it's okay to make an error. That's not, it's not a big deal. It's not the end of the world. In fact, everybody's done it and I'm getting recognized for it. So those kind of things can help build that confidence and confidence. Hey, um, we even did one where we had unexpected error. You made the most unexpected error with this new system that we've ever seen. It's awesome. Right, so celebrate that because that means the person's using, experimenting, and working with the system. And that's what you want. People will eventually settle down into using it properly and using it effectively. And then also, it will help people better perform complex tasks. So as you're working with the software and doing complex things in the software, having people be comfortable and, and toward mastering and getting better is a, is a great way to do that. The final level is this relatedness. And that's basically an individual's um, need to feel connected to others. You want to feel connected in the moment. Hey, can I message somebody? Can I ask somebody? Or connected to others through previous experience. So for instance, this is the average performance. Oh, then I know lots of people are, are doing this because there's this average. Oh, 120 people are logged in. Oh, so people are using this system. It's not just me. I feel like I'm the only one, you know, using this. So those kind of messages, leaving messages, having leaderboards, having milestones, 80% of the people in our university have, you know, achieved this badge. Oh, okay. Other people have done it. Great. So that just gives me the sense that, I'm, that, that, that we're together. Um, it also helps satisfy uh, people. Pe when people have a common experience, uh, it gives them a closer relationship with one another. And finally, you can re achieve relatedness by um, having people accomplish a task and getting 
social support for it. So create super users who have coffee clutches, who talk to people about, hey, we're not going to really have an agenda here. We're just going to talk about the digitization process, what happened, how it's going, and things you can do to maybe make your job a little easier. Uh, on the internet, you see, you know, life hacks, right? Computer hacks, all those kind of things. It's the idea of, of, of a shared secret that we can implement to make our jobs easier. And that can be uh, really satisfying as well. So uh, implementing gamification techniques, as Ben Franklin said, you know, tell me and I forget, teach me and I might remember, but involve me and I'll learn. So I've been talking about that theme as we've been going along. So where can you use gamification? And I've seen it used in lots of different places within the organization. So within registering, within human resources, diversity and inclusion is a really good space to use that. Bursar's office leadership and deans, uh, helping administrative assistants. So all of those places are where you can do some gamification and where you can help people um, leverage the gamification digitization. Let me give you uh, some examples. So um, visibility into performance. So for example, we have, uh, as you can, well, we had not so much anymore, but we had lots of travel requests, you know, universally lots of people travel. And for some reason, travel is not always on the top of everybody's priority mind, filling out all the travel paperwork. It just doesn't seem to be like the number one thing people want to do, although it eventually leads to getting paid. So I'm not sure why it's so slow, but one of the things that I saw implemented was this, it, they called it, um, what was it? It was like race to the, um, what was it? Uh, race to the, it wasn't race to the finish, it was race to the goal or something like that. And basically it was see how fast your department could get in um, after you submitted uh, travel, how fast you could get the travel paperwork done and get the people in your department paid. And so there was percentages about how fast this department was and they, they had this little race car uh, animation. You didn't have to go see the race car animation. Uh, I like to see it, but other people didn't, but it actually, increase the performance at which people got in their uh, expense report. And it's funny when you would come back and people would say, hey, Carl, you, you traveled, uh, you just got back. Yeah, how's your trip? Great, where's your expense report? Well, why do you care? Well, because our department, we, we gotta catch up, we gotta do this. So it was kind of a fun thing. And everybody knew that there was no big you know, prize at the end. It was just kind of a fun thing to do. And some fun ribbing over lunch about getting expense reports in. So that's, that's one thing. You could also have knowledge of how you're doing compared to others. So if you know there's a standard that, or an average that most people are performing against, you would work toward that average. So you would go to, in that direction. So that's where dashboards, that's where um, progress bars come in. That's where badges, we've actually had um, uh, university-wide meetings where the dean has stood up and recommended some of uh, recognize some of his admin assistants who've earned certain badges. Uh, there was even like a, an expedited paperwork badge for somebody that would get paperwork through really, really quick. And then there was <laughs> the counter badge to that was too much expedited paperwork badge, which meant you maybe were doing a little bit too much uh, outside of the system and you need to get back in the system. So all kinds of fun that you can have with it in, in, in a way that kind of builds the culture. Uh, and then also gamification, because it is transparent, it can provide a clear indication of action. So we did one thing for training. And what we did was we sent out, um, this was uh, for training the staff on some compliance things. We sent out videos and we just sent them out via, um, via uh, just email, sent out these videos about certain things that you had to do. And then, but the, but the gamification was um, once you watch the video, you went online to fill out this quiz and uh, whoever did it first with the highest score, you would accumulate points. And at the end of that month, you would get recognized for the points. And I think there was, at that time, there was a pizza party for, for the, the group, right? So it, what that did was it ensured that people watched and paid attention to the videos because they knew that they were going to be assessed on them later on. And then they could do that to actually, uh, 
earn recognition and a pizza party. So that was actually a way that you could have a clear indication of yes, that they're, they're, you're driving the behavior of watching the videos so that you could do the content that you needed to do. So there's all kinds of ways to think about adding gamification. And as I said, um, before it adds a bit of levity to very serious actions, you know, we're in a very serious time. And um, I think if you think about um, much humor is, is, is a little bit um, helps us cope and helps us get through some of the difficult times because humor releases uh, dopamine, which is a um, helpful for the a boost for the brain. So there's all kinds of positives about it. Um, and so, many people think, oh, you're in the depth of depression, let's not laugh, or things are going really uh, bad, let's be all serious. But actually, that's the time to add a bit of levity to the situation. And if it's done correctly, gamification can actually help that by giving you senses of badges and progress and a little bit of friendly competition, depending on how you put that together. So uh, how you can use it for initial training, I kind of gave uh, an example of sending out videos, but you can do it um, in the beginning. Um, we've had, uh, you know, like any any university, we hire someone and, and it takes a little while to get them on board. So we've done some gamified onboarding programs to let people know about the university and where the university is and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Help sustaining motivation as you're rolling out more and more digital transformation. How do you sustain that? kind of motivation, and then how do you further engage people into learning more and wanting to learn more or use more in terms of products and functionality? So those are some examples of, of use cases for gamification. And just to conclude, when you think about implementing gamification and digital transformation, think about these four things. One is, and I think they apply to a lot of different things, but digital transformation and gamification in particular. One is be purposeful about your goals. Why is this process procedure in place? What are we trying to accomplish? Who's gonna benefit and what will be the ultimate outcome? Second is consider basic human motivators. People wanna feel that they are in some level of control. They wanna feel that they're able to master a concept. So if you tell me, hey Carl, tomorrow I want you to do brain surgery, I, I would, give up, I, 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 don't, I couldn't master it in one day. So don't put unrealistic things on them like that. And then finally, the sense of connection. Make sure that you connect people, especially in the university, if you're in one building and somebody's in another building and admin's in a third building and you don't have a lot. So build these digital areas of connection. I'll also think about digital transformation as being a means, not an end. It, there's no, you know, I, I had somebody uh, one time, I, I was doing some consulting and the guy unit said to me, you know, Carl, this ERP system would be awesome if it wasn't for the end users. And I'm like, Ed, end user, like that's why we have the system. He goes, I know, but they just mess it up. So uh, the, <laughs> the concept is digital transformation in and of itself is not a goal. Digital transformation helps you do something else. So that should just be a way stop on your way to something else. And then finally, understand your processes, simplify them, and then automate. Don't jump in to automation first. So that's my presentation. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. And Katie, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Carl. That was fantastic. Thanks. I definitely picked up on some things that um, I'm interested in, seeing how we can implement equality as well. So with that in mind, I'm going to pass it over actually to you, uh, our audience members. If you have a question, go ahead and type it in the question box and we have about five minutes. We'll go through a few. Um, and while I'm waiting for some other folks to type questions, we did have one come in, Carl, that I wanted to, to go through. Um, okay. Stephanie had asked, are there any low cost or free tools that uh, we can use, especially right now being remote, that could help us get started on implementing some of the examples or some strategies for for gamification yeah so so um one for uh planning purposes i mentioned a uh, google jamboard is uh, a free or inexpensive tool that can be used for planning purposes moving sticky notes around i find that to be really helpful um if you look at um if you have any html experience uh, wordpress actually has a number of different plugins um, that have gamified elements on them. So those can be used as well. 
Um, if you have um, one of the bigger, like Blackboard, Desire to Learn, some of those, I know some, uh, we have some courses in our university, like compliance courses and some uh, um, a training for our um, accounting staff that are in those packages themselves. That's where the course is to teach them how to use that software. And those uh, tools often have gamification built into them that you'd have to see if your university has purchased that, you know, option, but faculty might be using it and you might be able to, to, to do that as well. Um, there's, um, uh, um, uh, I'm forgetting now there's, um, uh, I think if you Google like badging initiative or something like that, there's a, there's a whole group that has uh, free badging and you can assign a badge to a certain process that you do. So there are a number of different uh, of free uses. The, the only problem with, um, and I say that's a great place to start and pilot and check it out and see if the automation works. Um, it's not always integrated into other systems. So um, you have to be a little more clever on how you award and do things like that, but um, it can definitely be done. Um, we even had one instance where um, we had our, uh, somebody in our apartment, um, he just kept track like with the old good old hash marks of people that sent him emails back. And then at the end, he sent a gift card. So it was no uh, automated process at all. But those are some uh, software tools that uh, can be um, used in uh, doing the, the, digi uh, the, um, the gamification. Perfect. Those sound interesting, especially the Jamboard. I think that that would be an interesting one to try. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. It's pretty interesting. We had, we had one more question come in that um, someone had asked, do you have any recommendations for a software tool for creating a live leaderboard? And that was from Laura. Yeah, so um, I, I, the one that we've used actually, as I said before, is uh, WordPress has a leaderboard plugin. And I think that's a good place to look uh, in terms of using a leaderboard and in terms of working with that. That's really, we haven't, um, as I said before, you know, leaderboard, leaderboards work best when they're team focused. Um, so um, what, what we usually do is, is take a, the, the WordPress plugin and we make it team oriented. And so it's not individual people on the leaderboard, but it's names of teams. And lots of people have a lot of fun coming up with team names and doing some team stuff like that. So um, I, I would look there first as kind of a, a, an easy to use software tool for creating a live leaderboard. And then um, there are, are more sophisticated ones, but we've had a lot of luck with, with uh, the WordPress plugin. Great. Carl, I think the last question I have for you is, I thought personally some of the examples you showed were really helpful. Or, or shared were really helpful. Mm -hmm. Is there a place uh, individuals could go to get more inspiration for other ideas of things they could implement, whether you have something like that on your site or another site that you've seen before? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I uh, have a couple of courses on lynda.com, which is uh, now LinkedIn Learning. And most universities have access to LinkedIn Learning. And I have a course on there um, called Gamification. There's two courses on Gamification. Sure. The first course on there has a whole chapter on um, case studies. So there's like three case studies of how gamification has been implemented in organizations. And um, that would be a good place to go and look. And then if anybody else is interested in more and kind of reading a book about it, um, I have a book called The Gamification of Learning and Instruction, which uh, provides a number of uh, examples as well. And, if you're into the research side of it, it's, it has all the research uh, to back up everything I've been saying. Um, so it's not just my opinion. Um, and you can uh, look in that book and find those articles and, and refer to them and see how other organizations have implemented gamification as well. Perfect. Well, thank you, Carl, again, for your presentation today. Thank you everyone for joining. And uh, let us know if you need anything. Otherwise, have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.